Welcome to the midweek Space News Roundup. So I'm going to go over Space News for this week. The first uh, story I'm going to talk about is Firefly. If you've not heard, there's, there's been an accident on the, the test stand. Uh, we don't have video from Firefly, but we do have a security camera that was nearby and it recorded the, um, the incident. So we can just bring it up and watch it here. So this is for uh, flight seven and it looks like the whole vehicle uh, which was fueled just blew up on the stand and in a minute you see another explosion so probably the propellant tanks also went up um, so complete loss of the vehicle and probably a there, there it goes i guess that's the propellant tanks so it looks like um the whole not just the vehicle but the test stand is also being destroyed are heavily damaged um, based on the size of the explosion anyway um, so that that's not good at all for Firefly they are working on a larger vehicle with a uh, Northrop Grumman called the um, yeah the Eclipse there it is um, and this is a medium launch vehicle uh, the, the vehicle that blew up was the Alpha rocket which is a small small sat launcher I um, did a video after the failure of flight 6 uh, explaining that Firefly doesn't seem to have a lot of success with its um, rockets. Of the six flights, only two were really completely successful. Uh, two were partially successful and two were complete failures. And now with the destruction of um, the seventh vehicle and the test stand, um, I'm not sure there's much future for Firefly Aerospace in launching at least a small rocket uh, vehicle. You look at the success rate compared to their biggest competitor, which is is Rocket Lab, the Electron vehicle. It's not it's not SpaceX, it's Falcon 9, which is medium lift vehicle. It's it's uh, the Electron vehicle, and Electron now has a 94% success rate, and it's probably higher than that now because it's launched a few times since this graphic was done. So it's probably 94, 95% reliable, uh, with you know 70 launches. Um, Firefly has six launches, only two successful, and, and now they've destroyed the seventh vehicle and the test stand. So it may be time for Firefly to um, exit the uh, the small launch vehicle market. And either um, I had a few options when I did a video um, explaining what the options are for Firefly. The first option is persist with Alpha, address technical issues, and hope the mid tier market is sustainable. Uh, the second option is just pivot to the medium lift vehicle, that's the Eclipse vehicle. And um, the, the payloads are more lucrative and the downside is more resources are needed. And the third option is to focus on lunar and orbital services. So this avoids competition with established players, you're not competing with SpaceX or Rocket Lab. I mean the, the lunar lander, the Blue Ghost lunar lander was fantastic, 100% successful. And of all the NASA commercial lunar payloads, only the Firefly's Blue Ghost was successful, 100%. Intuitive Machines had two landers. The first was partially successful. The second one was a failure, really. And the astrobotic Peregrine couldn't make it out of Earth's orbit and crashed back um, in the Pacific Ocean. So Blue Ghost has a, um, uh, has a good lunar lander that makes them money. They've got Blue Ghost 2, 3, 4 coming up. That is where they're making money. And also, um, they're working on services for the moon. They're working on, a, I think it's called Oculus, which is a imaging system for the moon. It can scan the surface. It can map certain materials that are, I think, ilmenite uh, in particular, is very good at capturing helium-3 volatiles. So if you can find those areas that are rich in this kind of material, that would be a, a good place to start mining for helium-3 or other materials or elements. So they're working on that, they're working on space domain awareness, lunar reconnaissance, communications around the moon, plus space tugs. They have their electro uh, space tugs, uh, orbital transfer vehicles, they have them around the Earth, and they have their, I think it's called the Electrodark, which is uh, a space tug that can be used around the moon. So they may want to pivot away from the small launcher market, uh, which hasn't really been a success for them. And I don't think it makes them any money. 
either um, put their focuses on the medium launch vehicle and are their moon landers and uh, lunar reconnaissance uh, satellites and space tugs. We'll see what they do. Um, there's a quote from Firefly saying, uh, during testing at Firefly's facility in Briggs, Texas, the first stage of Firefly's Alpha Flight 7 rocket experienced an event that resulted in a loss of the stage. Proper safety protocols were followed and all personnel are safe. The company is assessing the impact to its stage stage test stand and no other facilities were impacted. So that's the official statement, but uh, I think they may want to exit the small launcher market. It's not really been a success for them. So on to the, the next story, which is about Xeno Power. Um, and do I have a graphic? So um, this is agreement between Xeno Power and Arano uh, that unlocks a Mauritium 241, which is a radioactive uh, material that can be used in RTGs or nuclear batteries. And basically this unlocks um, a supply of this material to um, Xeno Power for use in nuclear batteries. So Orano will um, recycle a nuclear waste and um, convert it into a Mauritium 241. There's actually a video they have on their site that explains it. It's a very complicated process, but um, apparently it works. This will unlock uh, quite large amounts of a Mauritium 241. Basically, this is a long-lived isotope uh, that's uniquely suited for space power. NASA's interested in this. NASA uses the plutonium-238 for a lot of its missions, uh, definitely the outer planet missions. But of course, it's, it's, it's very scarce. It's weapons-grade material. It's very dangerous to handle. You don't want it to go, um, you know, you've got to handle it very carefully. Um, so Munisim-241 is um, a better, really a better isotope to use. Uh, it's got a very long uh, half-life. So uh, Xenopower is currently using strontium-90 in their RTGs, um, which is, um, they have a source of that from the US Department of Energy. And now they've got this agreement for a Mauritium 241. It may be useful. I've got a, I think a graphic I can put up here. I did this for one of my previous videos. Xenopower's batteries use strontium-90. Uh, it has a half-life of 28 years, and um, that's the amount of power you get from it. 0.95 watts per gram, but you wouldn't have it pure. You'd put it inside um, this material. So you get about half a watt per gram. And it's quite abundant and cheap. So that's what um, Xenon Power is using at the moment. NASA uh, is, is more interested in the Mauritius 241 because the half-life is much, much higher, over 400 years. Uh, it does uh, produce not as much thermal heat uh, and electricity, but again, it's abundant and um, the long half-life, I think, is uh, the big, the big deal for uh, for NASA. So Xenopower is working on that, and um, they are already have a um, an agreement with iSpace to power one of their lunar landers with um, with a nuclear battery. And the idea is that the the rover can then survive over the lunar night, which is fourteen days, and then can revive itself during the day when the when the sun hits the solar panels. It'll have enough energy to continue with its, uh, its mission and uh, power the payloads. But just, just surviving over the lunar night would be uh, uh, very beneficial. So moving on to the next story, this is ISA Aerospace. ISA Aerospace is a German space startup. So I'll have that running. So they're a German uh, startup. I've got quite a lot of money in funding, hundreds of millions of euros in funding. They've attempted to launch once, and this is the very first launch attempt, which didn't go according to plan, but uh, they've signed a launch agreement with Allspace, which is, which is an Austrian uh, uh, satellite manufacturer. And under the agreement, uh, ISA Aerospace will launch two Allspace satellites aboard its Spectrum launch vehicle, which is the one you can see on screen, in 2026 from the Andaya spaceport, which is, which is where this vehicle is launching from. And further flights are planned in 2026 and 2027. The Allspace satellites perform in-orbit demonstrations for customers during these planned missions, and that will facilitate the validation of next-generation satellite technologies and services in space. Uh, and the main thing driving these early launch agreements is the sheer number of satellites uh, being developed in Europe uh, by companies looking for a quick path to orbit. The problem with the American launches is they're very difficult to get onto, they're, they're booked already, and um, 
Raul Vidu, who is a co-founder of PLD Space, that's a Spanish space startup, is saying the reality is that in Europe today, there's very limited launch availability and the few options that exist are already oversubscribed. Um, in the United States, there is no immediate availability and low opportunities for dedicated flights, which makes it difficult for smaller payload operators. This mismatch between supply and demand has benefited PLD. They're, um, they've got 80% of their flights booked until 2027. There's other European launch providers. There's Arbex and Skyroar from the UK, which should be launching in 2026. Skyroar already has a launch license due to the congestion at Saxe Ford Spaceport. Won't launch until 20, 2026. Hopefully Arbex and Skyroar launch. PLD Space should be launching in 2026. ISA Aerospace should be, and perhaps some other companies as well. Um, so there should be hopefully a lot of European uh, launch activity next year. Starlab has announced their manufacturing partner for their space modules, and that will be Vivance, Vivace. Uh, Vivace will build the station's primary structure. So they're a company based in the US and based at NASA's Michoud assembly facility near New Orleans. They manufacture flight hardware, ground support equipment, uh, development hardware, tooling and engineering services. A lot of the space startups uh, have used Thales Alenia. Uh, Axiom Space is using Thales Alenia, which is a big European um, aerospace company that manufactures modules for the, the International Space Station Gateway and so on. Um, but um, Starlab has gone with an American company called Vivace. And also Vast Space is manufacturing its own modules in the US. In other news about Starlab, um, it's announced that they're in, they have a strategic partner uh, called Space Application Services, or Space Apps for short. Uh, this is a Belgian company uh, that exp have expertise in space engineering and payload integration. They're closely uh, aligned with the European Space Agency and international partners, and that will help Starlab access more global markets. Uh, the CEO of Starlab said, Marshall Smith said, Adding space apps as both an investor and partner proves we're rapidly moving from design to reality. With additional capital and ex expertise from international partners, we're not just building the most advanced commercial space station and offering our customers exceptional capabilities, we're accelerating scientific discovery and de defining the next era of space exploration. Let's move on to the next story, which is about Blue Origin, partnering with a Luxembourg company uh, working on Project Oasis, which is to map lunar resources. Um, so there's quite a few space startups interested in mining the moon for various things, helium-3, or to produce uh, lunar water or propellant. But the first thing you need to do is find where those resources are located. They say in the, um, the news story that the project's first mission, known as Oasis-1, will send a small satellite into lunar orbit to map reserves of water ice, helium-3, radionucleotides, uh, rare earth elements, precious metals, and other materials that could be used by space settlers or sent back to Earth. And Pat Remius from Blue Origin says, Once we know what's really there and how to access it, everything changes. Project Oasis creates foundation for a thriving space economy that benefits everyone including the billions of individuals on Earth who will benefit from space-based resources. In reality, I think the only resource that would make financial sense, commercial sense, to send back to Earth is helium-3. The other resources are great for use on the Moon, for construction, for habitats, for shielding, um, for water, for like a drinking or um, hydroponics, and hydrogen and oxygen for propellant or a fuel cell system but you you wouldn't make any money bringing them back to earth i don't think the next story is on ispace and they have partnered with elevation space which is uh, another japanese company so both these companies are japanese and they intend to have a moon sample return mission they've announced this week that they uh, they both teamed up to provide um, a private mission to return missions from the lunar surface if successful this would be the first time a japanese mission will bring back a piece of the moon. Of course, NASA has uh, during the Apollo missions. China has uh, brought back um, lunar samples. I think Russia has at some point. Um, but this is an entirely private mission by two Japanese companies. 
So the iSpace CEO, Takeshi Hakamada, said, the re-entry and recovery technologies being advanced by elevation, by elevation space are key elemental technologies for implementing lunar sample return. We are confident that combining these with our orbital transport vehicle and operational technologies that we are developing to deliver payloads to the moon will bring us closer to realizing a sample return mission. And iSpace are very, very um, focused on building partnerships for the moon. They have a partnership with, um, with now Elevation Space. They have a partnership with um, Xeno Power for the nuclear batteries. They have a partnership with, uh, this is their Series 3 lander. Uh, so this is iSpace, their US office, which means they will be eligible for commercial lunar payload services uh, grants and awards. This is their larger lander, hopefully land on the moon and um, successfully. And it will potentially maybe have NASA payloads or you know payloads from commercial companies They've tried to land on the moon twice, sensor issues, so hopefully the third time they will manage to get it uh, right and land successfully. Okay, so let's, let's get into the, um, some other stories. And these are mostly IAC 2025, that's the International Astronomical um, Congress 2025. It's a big space meetup. In this, this year it's in Australia, in Sydney. Many, many um, space agencies were there private companies. Uh, so quite a few announcements came from there. And there's some kind of team up between Japan or JAXA and India. So this is an Indian lunar lander. And you can see in the background, this is Japan's lunar cruiser, which is a pressurized uh, rover. That is Japan's contribution to the Artemis uh, campaign. NASA is working on the um, unpressurized rovers, but this one is pressurized and it can send uh, astronauts can do missions for I think eight to thirty days, uh, just move, uh, just traveling around the moon, which is awesome. And we have also from the same meetup, the IAC. You can see in the background this is a lunar outpost with their LTV, their lunar rover. So three are in contention to be um, to go to the moon, uh, paid for by NASA. You've got the lunar outpost. You can see in the background. You've got Intuitive Machines Moon Racer, and you have. Astro Labs Flex Rover. Um, so all three uh, are being designed, developed, and now they're being tested and validated by NASA, and NASA will decide which one is going to the moon. Here is um, Astro Labs Flex a Rover. You, you can see that this is what the wheels look like, and they're quite deformable, which allows it to go over rocks and um, hazards and so on safely. So we have another photo of Astrolab and their flex vehicle. Again, they had a booth at the um, IAC, and so that's basically what it looks like. We also have a video from, we can bring it up. This is the, this is the um, Sean Duffy. He's the acting NASA administrator, and he was, uh, he was at the conference meeting lots of uh, uh, other space agencies. I think it was 36 of the 58 NASA Artemis partners were there. He had one-to-ones. There was a big meeting. You can see them all there, all meeting together, discussing um, agreements and so on. There's the Artemis cards. Um, so it's a big meetup, lots and lots of um, heads of agencies and the private companies um, went to that meeting. And we have some more, we have some more slides. I think there's 7,000 delegates at the meeting, more photos. And that is the ESA Director General. He's giving some kind of talk there at the meeting. Um, so yeah, that, that was a big meeting. Some, uh, some of the news came from announcements at IAC, and perhaps there'll be more announcements in the next few days and weeks, because I think it's still going, the, uh, the, um, the conference. So I think that is all the space news I want to talk about uh, this week. So thank you for listening, and I'll see you next time.